Jeanette Armstrong, presentation topic, the subjugation of indigenous governance, the Salishan inter-aerial construct. Cook's Jam Thompson Rivers University, Cook's Jam Irvin K. Barber Shistkin, Ala. Disquest Lachlach, Stuanum, the Kalmukum, and Seelichin, Tilson Pinkton, Cook's Jam. And just also add my greetings uh, to um, the other uh, invited speakers that were here in addition to my. Shiwapmukchin uh, greetings to uh, my relatives here in Um I used uh, the Shiwapmuk language haltingly, uh, although I can understand it and uh, speak quite a bit of it. Uh, one of the uh, protocols of our people from the Nshilchin is to uh, know and understand and speak. Uh, our relatives' uh, languages, if you come from specific families um, that um, interact in the way that I'm going to talk about. So I felt it really necessary and appropriate to, uh, to greet you in, in your language, in your land, with the little shushwap that I do know. So um, one of the reasons that I, that I mentioned that is uh, also to provide a disclaimer um, in that I'm not a lawyer from the legal profession, um, that um, in this uh, talk that I'm speaking mostly as a Sukhpaqwa Lula, which in my language and uh, Seelichchen um, from the Okanagan means a speaker for the land, um, really actually means a speaker in defense of the land. I am a fluent speaker. And I've been a scholar of my language and my traditions and my laws since I was a child. Um, and um, one of the reasons I count myself in the Sukhpaqwa Lula and, and I'm counted in, in that uh, tradition in our communities um, is that I have been a legal interpreter um, for the elders of my nation who are now passed away. Uh, Tommy Gregory and Harry Robinson and all of those elders who have now gone. Um, I was their legal interpreter in many of our, in many of our meetings um, at UBCIC and other, other meetings in which uh, our lands and, and our title and our rights and our stestest, which is different than title and rights, is spoken about. And um, I, I'm talking today from, from that tradition um, rather than from the idea of subjugation, um, because I don't think we've ever been subjugated, and I don't think we ever will be. And I think that's a construct we have to get out of our minds. Um, so one of the things that I think about um, is that uh, as an interpreter of the language in terms of meaning in legal terminology and and an interpreter of the oral texts, which are our historical documents, uh, known as Chaptiklin and Smayam in our language, which contains the laws and the knowledge uh, of the many thousands of years of our people's lives and occupation and uh, work on our lands to protect it and care for it. And it's for those reasons also that I have uh, traveled and spoken about that because I'm also uh, very clearly and obviously uh, aware of uh, some of the realities that were covered by some of the speakers this morning. Um, but I was made aware of them not from the legal professionals. I later came to that in coming to know wonderful people like Louise Mandel and others. Um, I came to know those realities later um, in terms of what the terminologies in law might be or what the realities in the doctrine of discovering might be. Uh, I knew the reality of who we are as a Seelch people and as Salih people, the Salishan people, from my grandparents and from speakers 
who never spoke English at all. And uh, that reality is what I wish really to talk about today, but I want to talk about it in terms of some of the supporting written reports and written evidence which I've been able to uh, corroborate and, and correlate to what I've already was told and, and know from people like Tommy Gregory and, uh, and other elders who've now passed away. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, some of the points in the slide are drawn from um, research of reports of early ethnographers, as you'll see, in, and uh, language experts and so on um, in the early parts. So I just begin with uh, talking about uh, who, who are the Salishan and why do I use the word Salishan rather than Okanagan or Nsilichan or, or one of those other terms. Uh, one of the reasons that I use that term is because my understanding from my own oral traditions, the Chaptik, is that Sa'alich is the original name of our peoples that later divided up into a number of different language groups. And that's what I'm going to begin talking about just to lay the foundation of what I want to talk about in terms of the governance and the inter construct. So just uh, the... Uh, area of uh, the territory, um, this is from um, the um, Kuypers, who's, who's a uh, scholar of the linguistic groupings of the Salish and peoples. All of the Salish groups are outlined in white. As far north up there on the coast is Belakula, and as far south on the coast is uh, Tillamook, and then as far west as the Montana Flathead. So if you can look at the Kalispell and the Coeur d'Alene, they're all in Idaho in the Flatheader in Montana. And as you can see uh, where the 49th parallel goes, right in the middle of the Okanagan there. But those are all in white, all the ones in white are all the Salish-speaking peoples. So that forms a huge area in North America, a huge geographic land base in North America. Uh, so according to the data that's been collected, there was an older, older original language that separated into two main divisions over time and that developed into the, these language divisions. So you have the Coast Salish and the Interior Salish, and where I'm speaking right now is in the northern branch, the, the Shushuap division. These, these, these uh, words are from Kuiper's. They're not my words, so I'm just using a, a, a chart that he put up there. And you can see the Colville Okanagan under the southern branch. Um, and so you can see the 25 different language divisions, and there's, there's uh, two main divisions um, here in the interior Salish and, and four main divisions on the coast Salish. Go ahead. I wanted, I, I've, I'm, I'm also a, uh, a studier of the languages of the Salish and people, and uh, because I'm a fluent speaker of our old language, they call the Chaptik language, which is uh, considered by the Okanagan and Silkshin people the high language. But many of those words are words that are Proto Salish, and meaning all of these roots, these, and a whole dictionary of them, have. Are, have their origin in common in all of the Salishan languages in one form or another. These are just some examples of many of the common ones which are, have different prefixes or different suffixes or different interfixes. So you can see, uh, for instance, some really important, all of the main important ones, like sacred, for instance, ha ha, or, or even tmih, for instance, um, referring to the land, Tim Hula, referring to the land. Those are all words that belong to all 25 of the language groups and are used in one form or another and have survived the time frame of dividing up into those 25 different language groups. So these are some archaeologists, Graybert Butler. They cite research that archaeology and the whole of the Pacific Northwest suggests evidence of one common origin for this region that I was talking, but not for all the other regions where movement of different peoples came from elsewhere. But in this region, 
suggests evidence of one common origin. So the archaeologist uh, work also is uh, based on that depth of time to create those 25 different Salishan language dialects. And he called it the old Cordilleran culture based on artifacts, not on, not on linguistics. Um, <clears throat> still, this is just the uh, foundation uh, of, uh, of uh, theories related to, to the Salishan peoples, the reinforcing of a high level of constant inter aral trade, intermarriage, and intercultural exchange is observed. Now this, I know for sure, this is observed by virtually every scholar of Salishan peoples. They all record the same thing, this high level of constant inter aral trade, constant intermarriage, and constant intercultural exchange be between all the Salishan groups. So this is one of the things that uh, Kreuber, for instance, makes a statement in about in his, uh, in his travel up in the northwest in, in our part of the territory. In, his, in one of his writings, in one of his observations uh, of this area, he made the observation that although there didn't appear to be a political unit other than the village, what he couldn't understand was that everybody existed in a state of neutrality toward each other. They didn't fight each other. They didn't hate each other. They didn't kill each other. Um, and uh, they were linked by peaceful trade, by peaceful intermarriage, and participated in each other's ceremonies and festivals constantly. He characterized that linking to be like nations of the civilized world in a state of suspense of irreconcilable units. So even though the autonomous units weren't one big unit. There was really obviously autonomous units that never changed as in their autonomy, but they were all linked together. And they never tried to change one another. <laughs> so let's go to the next one. So um, the, these are some of the observations that I pulled out of some of those various readings of those uh, peoples who studied Salishan peoples. Also looking at uh, oral history, that's one of my areas of my PhD is I look at the texts that are called chaptik, which are commonly called legends or myths, which are actually not legends or myth, but document text of our knowledge and our travels and the names of our places and the laws that we interact with in symbolic form in terms of characters who carry that, those laws. So Salish and, and Ron probably could tell you more about that than, than, than I can because he's, he's done some excellent work in that area and he's PhD. But Salish and oral history and as well as ethnographic historian reports identify these areas, um, these mechanisms, and I'm calling them mechanisms right now um, because I think uh, we have to look at uh, uh, some of the work that that uh, we need to do that Louise talked about, which organizes them in terms of laws that can be interpreted uh, in the current law field. So the, the co-utilization of major resource sites, that is a continuing reality. That co-utilization has never stopped in terms of the major over superabundant sites. It has never stopped and it is still going on, both sides of the border. The interlocutory joint use areas, joint use areas that interlock two different groups or three different groups or four different groups in which, oh, we're so happy to go on top of Tulamine and meet our Nsakatma people every year at the Huckleberry Grounds <laughs> because they're camped right there with us and so on and so on and so on, right? Nobody in that Huckleberry Ground ever in my growing up, and I've gone there every year, has ever said, hey, you and up, get out of here. This is Okanagan territory or vice versa. We're happy to see one another. We're happy the berries are good this year and we're happy to visit and exchange stories and gifts and, and even money. 
Also, the regulated settlement of intergroup disputes. There was disputes because people tend to push their boundaries whenever they can, and sometimes they break laws like, uh, you know, usually having to do with marriage, which was one of the reasons the Okanagan and Shushawap had a little bit of a disagreement over 50 years. <laughs> and, um, but it was settled. It, it was clearly settled by the chiefs. And uh, clearly, we were given the direction by our chiefs at that time that there was to be no more disagreements between our peoples. And I don't think there has been since then. Uh, the peaceful, or, uh, and that's multiplied over and over and over again throughout Salish territory. So there, the peaceful, and our stories carry those those historical events in which those settlements took place, those agreements took place, as well as those times when those disputes and what they were over took place. The peaceful congregation of huge multi-tribal groups all over Salish territory, even today. I can go to Welpinit, I can go to Tanawat down in Yakima, I can go anywhere on the coast to Muckleshoot and there's nothing but Salish people <laughs> there congregating and eating what we like to eat and gambling the way we like to gamble. <laughs> um, so gift, property exchange and trade, gambling was big central, a central um, way and mechanism to create that trade and that exchange of goods and property at these places. Direct kinship. Our chiefs represent the law in that direct kinship line. They created the political alliances with all of the Salish and tribes by direct kinship lines. That direct order of kinship lineage is a very, very clear and well understood mechanism of law between our peoples. It allowed our people to go from one area to another where we had kin and understand their laws there and live with them and use their territory in the way that they set out and then go back to our territory. <clears throat> Multi-group military actions, many accounts of the Okanagan, the Shushwap, the Shalans, the Wenatchees, the Spokans all joining together. In fact, one of the stories that I know Nikwala was involved in was this 2,000 strong, 2,000 horses strong buffalo raid out into en enemy territory, and I won't say which enemy territory, <laughs> but there it was. Uh, Mike knows the story. Uh, so many of those stories are documented and exist even after contact. Those multi-group military actions were taking place and today they still take place, even as recently as 1995 here in this territory. Intergroup culture as a construct. Angelo Anastasio did a PhD back in 1958 or something like that. And what he was, he was a cult cultural anthropologist, what he was studying was um, what he talked about as the aerial framework of intergroup relations. What he, was, what he was looking at was saying, how do these guys interrelate in the plateau area? Why was it so peaceful? Because almost every ethnographer comes in and that's their first observation. Hey, these guys don't fight like those guys out in the plains. <laughs> What, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> Why are they always, you know, laughing and gambling and eating and potlatching and feasting <laughs> instead of fighting each other over these resources, right? So he did this thing to look at it in terms of environment. And uh, he, he, he first termed it in his dissertation as an inter-aerial framework of intergroup relations, but later his research showed that uh, what he found instead was a larger intergroup culture. What all the anthropologists were missing was an understanding of this broader framework outside of the language dialect group. A larger framework of intergroup culture, a culture that existed in a larger framework of interaction. 
that permitted or facilitated the intergroup relations. So it's this larger culture that allowed this peaceful intermarriage, kinship, and feasts and ceremonies and so on. So in other words, it was the peoples of one origin whose values, norms, rituals, conditions, and procedures which permitted that permitted a network of reciprocal interrelations. Reciprocity was at the bottom of that. That's very clear, and that's taught over again by Anastasio in, in his research. Reciprocity in terms of the mechanisms, the reasoning for the mechanisms of the intergroup relations. So I'm going to go to the next one. Oh, and I was going to say, too, that Anastasio expanded on that PhD in 1985. So it's, it's, it's kind of an important, I think, uh, uh, research uh, to look at because he does all these tables and he collects everybody, every ethnographer's data. And the data that he uses are right from the Lewis and Clark expedition all the way to 1850, which is 1805 right to 1855 in the southern plateau region. He does a little bit of work in the northern plateau region, which is what we're part of, but most of it is in the Salishan groups in the southern plateau region. And one of the things that he says is the same down there as it would be here, that it's the differences in the natural environment which underlie the group dynamics rather than the similarities. And I think that's one really important principle that there were different cultures of the Salishan that interacted because of the different environmental ecologies that was strung out along the two largest river systems in, on, in the Northwest. So the framework that that created of natural resources in terms of the terrain features, the routes of travel with lakes and rivers and mountains provided each group its own unique ecological niche. So, so every area has its own different ecology, which requires a different cultural um, way to look after it sustainably. And so therefore, every local unit had to have a respect of their own clear regulations about how to respect the resources in their territory. Because there's the wooded maritimes all the way to the interior hot, dry highlands, the plateau slopes and grasslands all the way to the arid sage flatlands down south in our area, and the lush river riparian lowlands all, all along the river system. So those are all extremely different from each other. So I give an example here of uh, salmon and um, the Salish and intergroup culture. So I'm not speaking about any one culture, but the, the, the larger overarching intergroup culture that, that salmon was at the center of, for an example. Up to one half of the food supply of all the Salishan peoples um, was uh, formed by salmon as a stable and dependable source of abundance. The fisheries of the Columbia and the R Fraser River systems filled the land with superabundance of salmon prior to contact. And this is uh, Anastasio's notes um, that uh, numbers of salmon were pointed out. It was pointed out by ethnographers that are on equal in any part of the earth that penetrate its branches even into the mountain elevations, every, every area. Well, one of the things we know that um, salmon is scarce in some areas. And the stories reflect that. The chapter reflects that. Our people from the Smilkameen, for instance, have no salmon on the Smilkameen River, and a number of other tributaries and so on are the same throughout both systems. So it created a necessary condition for the trade of fish products and the joint co-utilization or joint use or multi-use areas like the Kettle uh, Kettle Falls, which is a huge, huge uh, Salishan uh, fishery that drew, at the time of contact, 15 different Salishan tribal groups and two non-Salishan tribal groups to camp in that area. And uh, that was regulated by the Okanagan Colville people of that area. In fact, the Kettle Falls people with, that 
are my ancestor from my mother's side. My great-great-grandfather, Chief Kanakanahua, was the salmon chief who regulated the salmon fishery in that area for those 15 tribes. Chance talks about that in detail in his, in his uh, records related to the Hudson's Bay and the Northwest companies that were using that area and the quantities of fish taken and the regulations that were practiced by Chief Kankanahu in that area. And that's duplicated over and over and over again by other resource chiefs in different areas along the Fraser and along the lower Columbia areas because that was the most northern Columbia fishery. So also, uh, if, if you look at number four there, just skipping over the other two, the salmon ceremonials that create the intergroup reciprocity uh, also created a gift economy, achieving broad political alignment. So even today, you can go to Celilo, for instance, and there's a huge salmon ceremony there where salmon is, is provided for everyone to eat and salmon is gifted. You can go last week to the Okanagan Nations salmon festival and ceremonies at O.K. Falls where, where finally two years ago the salmon again reached after a lot of work by the Okanagan Nation Alliance to make the, the dams allow them to come through along with the Colville Confederated Tribe. The Okanagan salmon are now reaching our fishery again for the last two years. But years before that, we were hosting the salmon ceremony, feeding everyone salmon at that site and calling them back and calling everyone to come to those sites to come and eat with us and enjoy the salmon even though they weren't reaching there. The same salmon ceremony is still going on at Kettle Falls even though the salmon have not reached Kettle Falls since the building of the Grand Coulee Dam. So, continue on. So, also this, this whole idea of uh, the, um, the co-utilization, that idea of co-utilization doesn't mean co-ownership or co-autonomy. It means co-utilization, that there's agreements in place as to the sharing. In particular, the sharing that Louise just talked about. That kind of sharing is not known in the European countries because of this different idea about possession and ownership and exclusions, the idea of excluding everyone from the abundance that God gave us, right? We didn't make these fish. We didn't make these resources. Yeah, we have, we have the laws to protect them and to sustain them and to protect them from overuse and overkill. We have to observe those laws through our human intelligence. But that idea of exclusion from that sharing of the perfect gifts of nature and God is not our idea. That's not an indigenous construct. That's a construct of greed and selfishness. So, if you look at some of the ideas related to those legal underpinnings of that sharing, the co-utilization that becomes part of an intergroup culture, there are a number of measures that have to be put in place to regulate that co-utilization. You can't, our people didn't just throw it open and say, oh, okay, come one, come all, kill them all if you want, take them all this year. No, that never did happen. Our chiefs were very, very, very strict and continue to be. And thank goodness for that. Turn it over. <laughs> and I'm talking about all the Salish chiefs. So um, in terms of the this complex, it was a massive complex, much more massive than all of our researchers uh, can undertake in one setting, in one PhD or in one master's thesis. So there's a huge amount of work that, of research that needs to be done to identify the specifics of this massive complex among our 25 Salishan groups. The cooperating political concord it's not small insular villages as the level of political unity. It's autonomous villages 
that form the highest authority of a larger complex of allied and united peoples in that construct. There's a big difference in that. That autonomy of each village area or each local area is critically important. This is where we get hung up sometimes among each other. This is where we get hung up among our different language groups as well because of the criticalness and the necessity of that autonomy. <clears throat> so pre-contacted was the chiefs that facilitated that peaceful lateral cooperation between the diverse autonomous local units, allowing that political structure doesn't have to be top down, some king somewhere, a queen somewhere we've never seen and we never will likely see, um, you know, being at the head of the thing. The people that sit right here, right here, that know everything that grows, that know the needs of everything that lives on our land, that's the highest authority. That's the most knowledgeable person who should be passing laws about those things that we know about, that we care about, and that we're willing to give our lives to protect. So that's who our highest authority is. And given that there's, you know, political structure doesn't have to be that top-down thing, what is obvious is the presence of a political structure which maintained a different kind of social order that can be under different kind than conquest, defense, or capitalist societies. If you have to defend the stuff that you've taken from the very people that you've taken it from, or you have to defend it from others who want to take it from you, um, then you have, you have a, a defense society. If you're one of the ones that are doing the taking, then you're a conquest society and your political structure is structured that way. So you're answering to one general who's telling you, go over there, or one pope who's telling you, you can go over there and take that and plant your flag, just like Robert was telling us this morning. Capitalist societies, right? Capitalizing on the resources that other people looked after in a sustainable way, never overused, created societies that looked after them in that way and that still hold to those principles, that still believe in reciprocity, that still believe in the living things on the earth having as much right as the human beings because we depend on them. The Salish people enjoyed a social order in one of the largest known, peacefully structured, civilized political units of cooperation encompassing over 25 Salish and language groups. That's a huge thing for us to be aware of. It's a huge thing for us to understand as our right, as our stiftet. It's a huge thing for us to be knowledgeable about to be able to use in defense of those very lands and those very peoples and those very living things. So, next one. And I mentioned this before, but I just want to make some of these points that such a structure sustains order in which units don't compete. So it's not based on competition with each other, competition for trade, competition for resources, competition who's going to secure the most and stockpile the most and, and use the most against each other. That structure must always strive to cooperate. Collaboration, cooperation, harmony, harmonious levels of working together, playing together, thinking together, interrelating together in order to protect each other's autonomy. So it's not a matter of trying to subsume each other's autonomy, take over each other's autonomy, or control each other's autonomy, autonomy but trying to make sure your autonomy has to be intact in order for mine to be intact and protected. So I'm going to protect your autonomy and your power. I'm going to protect your authority. I'm going to stand with you every time somebody else tries to jump on you and, and get you out of the way. Because you standing there means I, I stand here. 
that's what that kind of cooperating unification means. So they operate out of the knowledge that local autonomy is an absolute requirement in the regeneration of local resources. I think that's something that the world needs right now. It's something that Louise was talking about earlier in terms of a new way to look at how we have to interact in terms of governance and law and human beings and living things on this earth. It's not just that indigenous people should recon reconsider this and rejuvenate this. I think this format can work for everyone in the world and should and needs to work for everyone in the world. So, but the fact that the ethnographer views are colored by those imperialist political structures as the standard to measure against um, whether or not a political structure exists as some of the legal authorities here have spoken about, it doesn't change what their studies prove that that structure was there, it was exercised, and it was known by virtually every Salishan person and, and embraced by every Salishan tribe in this whole of the 25 different groups. <clears throat> so the other, the other thing I really wanted to talk about too is this idea of being nomadic or semi-nomadic, as some of our peoples have been called implying those postage stamp occupation and, of course, empty lands. So if we're nomadic, if we're semi-nomadic, you know, the legal people here talked about it in better terminology than me. But it means that there's one little square place here where I get fish and then I somehow jump way over here. There's another square place over there where I get berries and I somehow jump over there and so on. Well, the people of each cooperating unit whether it was a language unit like the Nsilkjin, Shihwapmukjin, or whether it was a larger tribal unit, which in our case we have eight different tribes in the Nsilkjin, um, or whether it was a village unit like Pentikton, Sinpinkton is one village unit. Those people lived at and used virtually the same places every year. Every year, whether I went from Penticton to, say, head of the lake, those people there used their same hunting and gathering and food places every year. Whether they came here or whether we went over to, to the Arrow Lakes, it was the same thing. Every year they went there to the same places because that's where the berries grow, that's where the deer are, that's where the salmon are. Kettle Falls doesn't move somewhere, it's there. No? Uh, we knew exactly where to go, when to go, exact times of year. I grew up reading the leaves and the plants to say, oh, the fish are running up on top of nickel plate. I didn't have to go all the way up there and look in the water. My grandmothers taught me what plants to look at because the same temperature conditions there tells me it's ready up there. Right? So our people knew these things and they knew where to go, when to go, how often to go in order to keep it regenerating at 100%. You can't get any better than 100% regeneration and sustainability. That's what our Salish and peoples were able to achieve and accomplish on these lands. And it wasn't because we had a decimated population. We had a huge population base according to the statistics that have projected backward after the two waves of smallpox and other endemic diseases. And for sure our people didn't wander around at any time of the year looking for anything. They knew where everything was. The fact that their homes in some of those permanent use sites were easily transportable means they were smart. They were intelligent. They carried tule mats that were so light you could barely feel their weight. But that doesn't mean they weren't permanent use sites. Just because people build edifices and walls around them and call those permanent sites in Europe where there's defense cultures doesn't mean that our permanent use sites are built on the same construct of capitalism and greed. 
Our permanent use sites are built on intelligence, transportation, and economy of use of those areas, sustainability of use of those areas. So the territorial resources between those areas we moved around to, between those areas, were carefully protected by all the groups from over-exploitation through the lateral concord of trade and exclusions of access. Ron can tell you more about that. Our chiefs regulated those areas. They said, no, no, you don't hunt there. You go, we, you go over here where I tell you to go because that area is getting depleted. They had in, in the Sealston people's camps, people in the Smilkameen who read, who read the sheep, who read the goats, who read the deer and the moose and said, this year we don't go there, we go over there. Today, the women of our communities, because of the dryness of our land in that area for root digging, practice the same thing. You have to go to their community and ask the old ladies before you can dig, or you should. Otherwise, you're not being very knowledgeable if you go there and dig wherever you want. You go and you ask them, they say, oh, we're leaving that alone this year, we're going to go over here. So it can regenerate at 100%. And it can keep on regenerating and feeding everybody. Move. So I always think of United Nations of Salish and Peoples. That sounds pretty good, <laughs> I think. Um, and I was thinking that um, in terms of looking at uh, the, the chief's authorities in that, from the different levels, village to village, tribe to tribe, language group to language group, I was thinking about the potlatches and the role that they played, those different kinds of things that are still continued today, that are sort of thought about as as um, belief systems or, or uh, old, you know, old practices, old customs or whatever, were not. They were actually central and core uh, to our people's economies and to our people's political structures and their recognition of that. The Pashlats, the Stayam, the Stayam was the trading dance, the trading ceremony between us and the Shushwap and the Nchakapmuk people. And there are places specifically set out for that time. Uh, the winter dances, the snihuam, serious mechanisms. They're not, they're not just, you know, circus customs to be talked about. They're, they were serious places where our people met, rejuvenated, and prepared their procedures of friendship by talking with the spirits of the land. And relating that to each other, making those promises to each other at those places where our highest beliefs stand. So it's the same as somebody swearing on a Bible. When you go up to our winter dance pole and you hold that staff and you tell a Shushua person, you, you come and hunt in my territory this year with me for your feast for your brother. It's the same thing. It's, it's law. And it's a practice of understanding and respecting law among each other. So let's take a look at some of the discovery measures by Salish and Peoples pre-Confederation. This is after contact. Well, we know one thing. Um, I don't know what these mean in law, but I was looking at some of these different kinds of measures that we undertook to be anti doctrine <laughs> as Salish and people, just good examples. Uh, one of the core requirements was to retain ownership and use but allow purchases for proprietor trade settlement establishments. That's essentially what those treaties were for, was to allow those proprietary governments to establish a, a trade establishment there so that they could trade and benefit with, with them. Um, Lots of examples in the interior of BC in which passage through any of the Salish and territories required tariff payment to the chiefs. You had to pay our chiefs to go through our territory if you were not from one of the Salish and groups. If you were Shushwap, if you were Nchakapmuk, if you were Shalan, if you were Wenatchee, if you were Nkamkchin or Spokane, you could travel through our territory without paying tariff. But if you were not 
You had to pay tariff to go through our territory. And the non-native people, the fur traders, have accounts of having to pay tariff to our chiefs and or have an escort. If you weren't part of the Salish and peeps, peoples that we have those accords with, you had to be escorted. The dispersed people were always escorted through our territory when they came through our territory. And same with the early, early explorers. They were always sent with escorts appointed by the chiefs through our territory. Okay. So he lays out uh, pre-confederation reserves in the interior of BC in what their understanding was in the doctrine of discovery to protect their interests in the gold that was discovered in the 1860s in the Okanagan at Rock Creek and Smilkameen and the mission and so on. So he rushes in from, from over wherever he was stationed at out on the island to try to make these treaties so that they could protect from those miners that were coming up from Washington State, from Astoria and other areas. And uh, they got into a number of skirmishes with some uh, unruly miners at Rock Creek. And so Chilhitza, who was uh, chief at the time, sent for Governor Douglas and said, what are these guys doing here? And Governor Douglas said, well, they're not my people. They're, they're, uh, they're the um, US. Uh, I forget what he called them. There was a term that they used for them. The Boston men, that's what, <laughs> what they were called by our people. Anyway. So at that time, 1867 and prior to that, 1862, 1863, 1864, 1865, the Douglas Reserves were identified. Um, this is pre-Confederation. As far as I know from the Okanagan, I don't know about the other Douglas Reserves in, in any of the other areas because I didn't have time to study that yet. But those are the only agreements that I know of that our chiefs consented to. No land was ever surrendered to Douglas. For one thing, the colony was broken, couldn't buy lands anyway. But they agreed that Douglas agreement was to recognize and protect the use of those lands in collaboration with the chiefs who agreed that they could use and protect the use and passage through those lands. So at one of the largest Salish and intertribal chiefs gatherings, and I think that was at Boston Bar, I have to go back and look that up, um, he promises protections from whites in what he calls your own exclusive campgrounds. He doesn't talk about surrendering the lands outside of it. He's just saying, well, we'll protect you from these guys in these campgrounds, and nobody will you know, use it or live there, or do anything with it. So it's not about surrendering land or giving away land, it's really about protecting from these guys who were, you know, who were pretty unruly uh, in the frontier with a frontier mentality. After 1870, the 1874 statute that allowed the creation of provinces without treaty making, Tretch, who was the lieutenant governor, he dramatically reduced those Douglas reserves, which, which they had, the chiefs had stepped out themselves as campgrounds that were to be protected exclusively. They dramatically reduced those, those reserves into really tiny ones. An example in Penticton is uh, really dramatic, where Penticton was right from O.K. Falls all the way to Peachland. That's, that's the Douglas Reserve. It was reduced to what is now where the church is on the lower village at the base of the hill, and it's only like maybe a couple of hundred acres. And a lot of uh, starvation as a result in the interior because there was some hard, if you go back to the weather reports, there was some really hard winters that was just preceding this where many, many, many uh, animals and horses and people died. And in fact, um, one story which I'll tell you, Nikwala, who is the uh, high chief of the Okanagan at Douglas Lake, rounded up 150 head of his horses in the middle of winter and had his warriors drive them down through all of the seven Okanagan bands, leaving 20 horses at each community so they could get through the winter, so they could eat. And they, they uh, survived um, those winters. Some of the uh, 
oral stories are, are, are unimaginable um, in terms of that, that particular period because, of course, the fur trade was going through and there was a huge depletion of, of game animals in that area. So let's go to the next one. <clears throat> so this is a really good one. Um, in 1874, 1877, um, as a result of the Shushu Apokanagan Salish and People's Confederacy of War, which they gathered at the head of the lake, um, they just said, we had enough of this, you know. Douglas told us one thing and now these guys are telling us another thing. Um, we're going to go to war. And so there are these tele telegram, telegraphs, yeah, telegraphs were going back and forth between BC and the federal government and then this commission was put together to put that down. That, those were Salish people. Those were Okanagan, Shushuap and other interior groups that were saying, we've you know, we've had enough of these lies. So the McKinley Sproad Anderson Commission was struck up, but they were given the uh, orders to only deal with the size of the reserves. In other words, they were told, go increase their reserves and, you know, settle them down, but don't talk about the larger question. It's right in the wording of their, their orders. Don't talk about the larger overarching question of land and ownership. So that commission came only to use a divide and conquer. They, it's right in their, uh, right in their report uh, from the commission how the, the tactics they used to divide off bands and make them argue against each other by, by offering some bands some bigger pieces of land and, and bands that were saying, no, no, we're in this together, hiving them off. It's much like what's going on today. So uh, from 1876 to 1910, that commission in different forms operated to establish reserves. What's interesting about this point is that they included what is called commonage reserves. This is the only part in Canada, I understand, where that idea somehow emerged. Well, where did it emerge from? Our people understand joint use, common use, and multiple use areas and sharing. And it was with that spirit in mind that the idea of giving those settlers some rights to graze their cattle, some rights to use the timber, some rights to use the water, some rights maybe to put up a cabin or whatever. So that idea of creating a commonage which was retained by the Salish people but in this case, the Okanagan ones that I know of, I don't know about the other commonage reserves anywhere else, but I know about the Okanagan ones, that uh, four of them were established under that commission. And then behind closed doors in Ottawa, they were rescinded by order and council. And I think, in fact, one of them never was rescinded. And um, that's the one between Nicola than the uh, Upper Nicola and uh, ourselves in the Okanagan, um, in, the Oka in the Penticton and West Bank in, in Okanagan. But they were rescinded behind closed doors by order and council and they were thrown open to preemption. After those discussions with those chiefs at head of the lake, making those agreements and making those promises, that's, it's still an outstanding question that hasn't that hasn't been looked at or hasn't been dealt with. And one of the things that um, Tommy Gregory, for instance, talks about, and we have some of his tapes in the Yanaukan archives, um, was uh, some of the oral history that was, that was recognized and passed down that very clearly, and, and we later on look at the McKenna McBride uh, oral transcripts in which the chiefs say exactly Tommy says they said in that first uh, Royal Commission is that um, they, re they, they understand that they retain ownership, that we can share it with you, but we regulate it. We look after it. Um, we were put here and we're never going to sell it. We're never going to give it to you. We're never going to surrender. And so that whole idea was what Louise talked about 
more eloquently from the reading of it in the 1910 Interior Chiefs when they went to meet with Sir Wilfrid Laurier and declare that. Um, in, in that instance, uh, Laurier responded by preparing some legal questions to present to the courts. And in those ten questions, uh, I think there were ten, there may be seven, he included three questions that were directly related to title and rights in BC. And it's interesting to go back and look at what those questions are. I didn't list them here, but you can move. Um, okay, so. In 1911, a Dominion Order and Council ordered the Exchequer Court of Canada to begin legal proceedings on behalf of Indians in BC against the government of BC. So the federal government in 1911 asked these legal questions of the Exchequer Court and they started legal proceedings based on those questions. So what does that tell you? Okay. But politics come in. 1912, the Laurier Liberal government was defeated, and it was um, a non confidence vote that defeated Laurier. You could see why, right? <laughs> and replaced by Borden's conservative government, who scrapped that order in council. They didn't deal with it, even though they were ordered to deal with it, right, by the Exchequer Court. They scrapped it by another order in council and replaced it with a royal commission, which became the McKenna McBride Commission and became known as a cut off lands commission. It cut lands off further instead of dealing with the questions that were asked in that, that order in council to the Exchequer Court of Canada. So let's go to the next one. Well, as a result um, of the actions of the allied tribes at that time, led by Andy Paul, uh, to rally continued legal support through the Friends of the Indians, um, which, which uh, the doctrine of discovery response even reacted more strongly. A special joint committee of Senate and House of Commons in 1927 recommends future land claims activity be barred in British Columbia. So in other words, Andy Paul was going around, he was getting a lot of support. In fact, my dad and everybody know, know him by name, know all the things he said and can stand up if they were alive today and, and by rhetoric you say everything that he said. All our chiefs invited him to, the, to their community. We all heard his name when we were growing up in terms of that period between, 19, be, between 1913 and, and uh, 1927. Tommy Gurdy talks about those times in 1927 when um, any kind of gathering for land claims was against the law and people were taken and prosecuted for gathering to talk about our Aboriginal, Indigenous, Salishan rights that we practiced all our lives that was given to us by our Creator and that we looked after and protected for at least 13,000 years since glaciation in a sustainable manner. They amended the Indian Act to make it an offense to collect funds even for the purpose of advancing claims. It was right in the Indian Act that you couldn't collect money to pay a lawyer like we're, you know, used to paying today. We can call up Louise and if we can find money for her or she can find money then we can get her to work answering some of these questions. Well, it was against the law to do that in Canada for all of that period from 1927 to 1953, I believe, when it was taken off the books of the Indian Act. As well, potlatching, one of the most sacred ceremonies of gifting and political exchange and recognition of authority on our lands, who the chiefs are, who the titles are, who the title holders are, and how they're to exercise them, was spoken about at those potlatches, and the gift giving was in relation to that. That was outlawed in the same, the same piece of legislation. The potlatch law prosecuted my people for having winter dances. 
convinced some of our chiefs to report my grandfathers and grandmothers to the church chief who were paraded in Catholic church, humiliated because they were practicing winter dance, potlatch. I don't have any disregard for people's religions and beliefs, but I have a disregard and a hatred for that kind of racism practiced by anybody under any rubric, whether it's Christianity or, or other forms of religion. That is racist, that is wrong, that is part of this history, and is something we all have to clean up and we all have to know about. It's not something that should be hidden anymore. Throughout the years since, Salishan peoples have continued to meet for joint, multi-tribal, inter-nation, solidarity actions in political and legal battle, regardless of those laws, up to and including the late 1960s and early 1970s actions to totally shut down the offices of Indian Affairs in our territories. We kicked them out of our territories. Here, in Vernon, Chilliwack, everywhere, we shut down these Indian offices and we told them, we can make as many mistakes as you've made. In fact, we'll make fewer. We can run our stuff. So, it led up to the founding of UBCIC by Salishan leaders like George Manuel, the late George Manuel, the late Philip Paul, and many others of these Salishan tribes who are so strong in their understanding of this kind of solidarity. In fact, the first assembly of Union of BC Indian Chiefs that I came to and the formation of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs was right here in Kamloops when I was a young woman, I won't say a teenager, but I was interpreting for Tommy Gregory and my dad and others when I came to that meeting. I was reading Robert Miller's uh, last book in which Tracy Lindbergh talks about that, that uh, we need to revive, as, as others have said here this morning, we need to revive and strengthen our anti-doctrine strategies. We can't go on thinking somehow the courts are going to be more lenient or the courts are going to open their doors in different ways uh, if, if, we, if we just do this or do that. I really, really believe that our strategy has to be to exercise and assert what fundamentally was ours prior to confederation, pre-confederation, pre-doctrine of discovery and rejuvenate those things because in British Columbia, in Salishan territory, we have not relinquished that right in any way, shape, or form. So here's some what if questions that I leave you with. What if the 25 Salishan language groups work together legally to revive and rejuvenate its trade and political capacity and exercise jurisdictions in a de facto legal strategy? In other words, instead of Instead of uh, asking them, is this right or wrong, asking the courts, just acting on it, knowing what is right, understanding what is right, and acting on it, and having them then say, hey, wait a minute, and then they have to prove that we aren't right, like the Jules and Wilson case, which is you know, one of those kinds of strategies in which our chief said, no, we don't have to ask them. We'll, we'll just do it, and we'll hand out those things ourselves. So instead of uh, falling in line with the concepts of being a discovered people and the government's process of land claiming through its framework of doctrine of discovery law process in which they're eroding everything into postage stamps and less if they can, and the divide and conquer tactics in the treaty process, the so-called treaty process, uh, using the diminishment of power tactic in which each local autonomy is the only construct of their recognition. So that divide and conquer is being used in saying, oh, you're a First Nation, Penticton Indian Band. Well, what about the seal, the whole of the seal as a nation? What about the whole of the Shwapmuk as a nation? Right? And that joint use, overlaid, multi-use 
of all of our territories while well, we're sorting that out in the Okanagan between our, between our communities. We're starting to understand this principle and assert it in our way. <clears throat> what if the 25 Salish groups legally and actively insisted on the truth that we are a unique form of sustainable governance and we do indeed recognize our joint use areas as joint use areas. That's one of the tactics. You can't come in with a joint use area. You have to come in alone and claim it and make a treaty about it, right? And you have to prove that you own it and you're not jointly using it. <laughs> Guess what? You're being taken down that doctrine path in that one because there were joint use areas and they were regulated and by our chiefs and they were looked after sustainably by our chiefs. In fact, they helped in the protection of that political accord that we had. So our joint and multiple use resource sites should be rejuvenated and rethought about in terms of our assertion of their uses in those manners with the protocols developed by our chiefs in those areas, with the laws developed by the way that they undertook and today in contemporary world need to undertake it. The places that we jointly protected in these unique forms of indigenous governance that recognized, recognized and made sure they protected the local authorities as the highest level of power. Not the usurpation of local power in order for some one tribal person up on top. We had high chiefs who were spokesmen to talk with other language groups, but they never came into a reserve and said, hey, you, chief, you do this, you do that in your community, because that chief was his authority. That local chief was his authority, not the other way around. Okay. That we have here north of the 49th, I can't really, I haven't done as much research south of the 49th, that we have here demonstrated the rights of our political concord over and over again in these instances that I just mentioned in the various allied tribes actions and subsequent potlatch laws it generated and in the interior tribes of BC actions since the chief's declaration in 1910 and the legal questions that it's generated and which are still unanswered. What if all the interior Salish or all 25 both sides of the border, worked on legal recognition of those rights as per the UN declaration, instead of one little 500 group of people at a time, on the rights of indigenous peoples as a united Salishan peoples, understanding that the local chiefs, the local autonomy is the highest authority in that. So what does that mean? What does that look like? legally. Currently, is there even one North American nation, or for that matter, in the whole of the Western Hemisphere, is there even one nation sitting at the United Nations? No. That's what we have to change. That is what we will change. That's what our young scholars will change. My last question is, what have we got to lose that isn't already been taken through the racist process of law founded on the doctrine of discovery? Thank you. <laughs>